Good morning. Uh, welcome everybody to our um, DMLL Research Week uh, 2021. Uh, this year's theme is um, language and social justice in the Caribbean. So um, you may be wondering what is the relationship between language and social justice. Uh, well, I'm going to give you a brief introduction to the topic and then we will start with our presentations. So language is a central concern in contemporary conversations surrounding social justice, as it is evident in topics such as bilingual education, racial and gender discourse, uh, gender pronouns, migration discourses, multilingual signage in public spaces, and others. Uh, social justice uh, became an important theme in political and legal philosophy in the late 19th and 20th century. Um, and even though there is no single agreed definition of what social justice is, some of the common themes have to do with uh, equal distribution of resources, uh, respect for human rights, equal access to opportunities, political representation, cultural respect, social recognition. Um, the, in general, the concept of social justice entails a notion of group or collective rights, but also individual rights. Now, when language started to relate to social justice, um, those discussions that explicitly frame linguistic diversity and language use in terms of social justice are, are recent. Um, research concerned with um, relationships between lingu linguistic diversity and social inequity emerged mainly in the US in the 1960s when sociolinguistics and the ethnography of communication diverged from strictly formal approaches to the study of language and began to focus attention on the social issues of language and linguistic variation. Um, the presentations that you are attending this week um, in this event, they display different perspectives on language and its function in changing people's awareness of injustices and how by providing participation in civic and social practices to marginalized groups in their mother language, they are provided with equal opportunities to education, self-advocacy, and access to knowledge, healthcare, and protection of their human rights. Um, as we are about to start this event, I would like you to reflect about the following question. And I hope that by Wednesday, you are able to provide your own responses. So the question is, how can language guarantee equality to marginalized groups in the Caribbean? Uh, now, let me introduce um, our, uh, the Dean of the Faculty of Humanities and Education, Dr. Heather Cotto, um, to give you the welcome to this event. Uh, Dean? Good morning. Let me welcome everyone. And let me start by congratulating the Department of Modern Languages and Linguistics for the theme that they have chosen to guide these three days of interaction, language and social justice in the Caribbean. If I had the privilege of posing a question to you all this morning, it would be this one. How do we ensure that all, communi all communities can speak their truth? and that we know how to recognize it and interpret it. This question to me seems to be integral to the challenges that we are facing in 2021. If we can do this, I truly think we would have discovered the secret of how to change the world. As a Caribbean historian, I fully understand the importance of language. I still feel lost at history conferences when my colleagues from French and Spanish Caribbean present papers on very important issues. 
It is compounded to me by the fact that scholars from outside of the region show that they have the capacity to converse in Spanish, French, and English, but many of us do not in the British Caribbean. I must confess that I often feel as if I am missing a part of the world that should have been mine. Can we hope to understand the Caribbean without fully understanding its languages and linguistic diversity? To me, this is particularly ironic in a country like Trinidad and Tobago, where our history would cause any rational person in this world to think that our population would be versed in Spanish, French, English, and some form of Creole. In fact, the enslaved population and the indentured population were quite fluent in several languages. I think this alone should make all of us pause and think. We in the Caribbean should understand more than most about the importance of language and linguistic analysis. The dominant classes who have tried to control us through enslavement, indentorship, and even after independence have all depended on their control of the official language systems. In Trinidad, anglicization was used by the British to ensure that British language, laws, and customs gain prominence over those of the Spanish and French. This is the way in which colonial powers seize control in territories which already had their own strong traditions, but these traditions differed from those of the British. In some territories like St. Lucia, the supplanting of English on a French linguistic base has left an impact on that society even to today. The conflict between official or formal language and the unofficial language of the people has left a trail of injustice throughout our history. This spans from the courtroom to the classroom. Language skills have always been directly linked to our ability to interpret the world we live in. And more than that, to the nature of the space that we can carve out for ourselves. The loss of native and fewer languages has in fact been a, the loss of a very important part of ourselves. Our history has shown that the control of language is a source of power. So too, I want to suggest that the study of the related disciplines has the potential to empower all of us. Just as language has shaped our past, it is shaping our present and it will define our future. I keep saying that we are in the middle of a historical watershed. And what is being illuminated are the issues which we must face in the 21st century. These include the inequity made more visible by the pandemic. It includes the onset of a new decolonization phase with a fresh new wave of historicizing and demands for reparations at its very center. It includes the more, more recently the impact of the volcanic eruption that has shaken St. Vincent and neighboring territories. I want to suggest that the solutions will depend on the efficacy of local, regional, and international approaches, and most importantly, how well we can integrate them. Language must be the center if the solutions are to have maximum, maximum success. At heart, I simply want to say this morning that the study of language is especially important for countries and regions such as ours. The Department of Modern Languages and Linguistics is at the forefront of the drive to increase multilingualism, to foster our understanding of language, and to enhance cultural awareness among students, staff, and the general public. They do this through research, by supporting teaching and learning, and through promoting and encouraging our understanding of language or languages, and this can be for personal, academic, or personal mission. For personal purposes, sorry. Central to this mission, then, is our country and region's ability to grapple fully with our past and embrace the future. It is central to our ability to communicate effectively to audiences wherever they are or wherever they, have, they may have come from. 
or for that matter, wherever we may wish to go. This impact spans all spheres, social, cultural, political, and economic. Our world is fast shrinking. Access to outstanding language teaching and learning research, as well as support for language learning, are also essential for international exchanges, which include diplomacy and business. Our University of the West Indies has established a global dimension with units on all camp on continents. We encourage student exchanges. We now have global offerings and we are opening up access to our courses and programs. The Department of Modern Languages and Linguistics must lead the way as we develop this dimension of our teaching and learning focus. The department fosters collaboration and the sharing of expertise with other language providers, both within the university and other organizations nationally and internationally. I welcome you all. I invite you to sit back, relax, and to enjoy the next few days with us. There are a few advantages to this new virtual world, so pull up the most comfortable chair that you have in your home. To our future students out there, I really hope that by hearing about our research, you get a sense of how our disciplines can be applied to promote the kind of development that we really need in our region. I would like to thank the organizers I want to really congratulate the department for this very timely session. I will end by reminding us all that the study of language helps all of us to speak our truth. And that is an extremely powerful thing. Whether it be true English as a foreign language, French, German, Portuguese, Spanish, Creole, sign language, doesn't matter which, as Gramsci would say, it helps our community to speak our truth. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. Okay, so let's begin our presentations for today with um, our first presenter, Professor Elizabeth Walcott Hawkshaw. Um, she is a professor of French literature and creative writing at the University of the West Indies St. Augustine campus. She has published scholarly articles and essays on Francophone Caribbean literature and has co-edited different uh, several works. She has also published creative works. Her short stories have been widely translated and anthologized, most recently um, in New da Daughters of Africa, uh, Four Taxes Facing North, her first, her first collection of short stories was considered one of the best books of the year by the Caribbean Review of Books. Mrs. B, um, a novel, a novel uh, was shortlisted for best book of fiction in the Guyana Prize of Literature in 2014. Stigno Bills is her latest book, a collection of short stories published in 2020. Professor Elizabeth Walcott Hawkshaw is the current head of the department at the Department of Modern Languages and Linguistics at the University of Santa Cas at the University of the West Indies, Santa Augustine Campus. Professor Walcott Hawkshaw is presenting today the politics of voice or how to create dangerously, a discussion of the role of the writer in the search for social justice. So welcome, Professor Walcott Hawkshaw. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and before I start, I just want to thank the Dean for that, um, for that great address um, and, and, and letting everybody know the importance of languages. I also want to thank Paula and her team for all the work that they've done um, to bringing this research week together. And of course, all the presenters. That's in my heart as head. Um, I, I never like to follow the Dean because um, secretly I would have always wanted to be a historian. Most people don't know that, but it's the truth. Um, and they just have a wonderful way of contextualizing everything and, and bringing it all together. Um, so I'm gonna be talking to you this morning more as my hat as, a, as someone who writes fiction. Um, I have a, a PowerPoint presentation, so I'm gonna try and work my way through that. 
Um, I won't be able to answer the Dean's question, at least not directly, as to how communities speak their truth. But I do think it's a very important question that, the, that we should all consider um, and all of the challenges of, of languages. But this morning, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the writer's rule. So let me try and start to share my screen. And... Uh, I hope everybody's seeing it. Are you all seeing it, Paula? Yeah? Yes, we can see it. Okay. Yeah, so, so this is the title for my um, presentation and it's called um, The Politics of Voice or How to Create um, Dangerously. So where did I get this title from? Um, I stole the title from Edwidge Dantica, who um, has a book called Create Dangerously, The Immigrant Artist at Work. Um, and Dantica took that title, um, was inspired by Camus, but I, I will get to that. So what are some of the major questions that I really wanna ask this morning? Um, the first question that I think about when I think about writers and artists right now in general is, are we essential workers? Are we essential to, to the process of um, not only creation, but in the context of, of the pandemic, it, I've always kept thinking about essential workers and who are essential workers. And it, it always occurs to me, um, the position of the artist and the role of the artist, um, how essential are we? This is not a new question. This is a question that has been asked throughout time that artists always have to deal with. Um, but I think now it's even more important as to the role we play, particularly in terms of the theme of, the, of our research week, and that is social justice in the Caribbean and language, and I would also say um, the politics of voice. So Dantica talks about this um, notion of, of creating dangerously, and that's something I'll get to. So it's, it's the role of the artist, are we essential workers? Um, also, how do we create? What is the method of, of this creation? How does our role manifest um, itself? Um, do we write political works? Do we take political actions? By we, what I'm saying is, is artists and writers in general. Um, and then my last question, I know I have probably too, too many questions, but the last question relates also in the wider context of modern languages and linguistics, but also the faculty. Um, because humanities as a, as a, as a body of, of the university, not just in, in the Caribbean, but globally, humanities um, has been dealing with a decline um, in, in student numbers. Um, so I do think that it is related, this whole notion of, of the value of um, the humanities, humanitas, um, and, and the role of the artists and all that we do in, in the humanities. So those are my four questions that I'm not sure we can actually answer all of them, but that, that's where my thoughts are coming from. Um, so Danticat says that writers should create dangerously for people who read dangerously. This is what I've always thought it meant to be a writer. Writing, knowing in part that no matter how trivial your words may seem, someday, somewhere, someone may risk his or her life to read them. As you know, Dantica comes from Haiti. She was born in, in Port-au-Prince, um, and she left Haiti when she was 12, um, and mainly because of the situation there at the time, but also um, because of the fact of the effects of the Duvalier regime. Um, Dantica herself is quite prolific as a writer, and a lot of her works include novels, short fiction, um, she also writes memoirs, uh, and this comes from one of her essays, um, The Immigrant Artist at Work. Even though Dantica left Haiti when she was about 12, um, all of her works have always focused on the Haitian experience. Um, they don't necessarily talk about um, the, the political experience directly, although two works in particular seem to address that to me, um, The Dew Breaker, and, um, which is a collection of short fiction, and Brother I'm Dying, which deals with her uncle, who is, that's more of a memoir, who leaves um, 
Haiti to go to the U.S. and of course he's caught up in the immigration and he dies while um, being in um, the U.S. immigration. Um, so her works have a political tone to them, but they're not always um, directly political um, in that sense. Although a lot of her essays, and, and this book in particular, Create Dangerously, deals with um, the situation in Haiti um, and the fact that writers need to use their voice in, in a political way. It's been interesting that, that some of her later works um, some of Dante Katz's later works, for example, this last one here, um, everything inside has become much more um, personal, um, a lot of reflection, and not so much dealing with the Haitian situation, but more so about Dante Katz's personal situation. Um, she also wrote another book called The Art of, of Death <laughs> um, and The Art of Dying. Um, and it, it talks about the death of her mother. So her, her works have moved, um, not that she stopped having a political voice, um, but definitely moving towards a much more um, personal um, relationship with, with literature. So like I said, Dantika took this title, um, Create Dangerously, from um, Camus. And Camus first uttered the, this whole notion in a lecture that he gave in 1957 in Sweden. Um, and I'll just read a little bit of it. And I'm, I'm sure you can pick up the echoes of what Dante Kart has, has in, in her book. And he says, in the midst of such din, the writer cannot hope to remain aloof in order to pursue the reflections and images that are there to him. Until the present moment, remaining aloof has always been possible in history. When someone did not approve, he could always keep silent or talk of something else. Today, everything is changed and even silence has dangerous implications. Um, I think those words can echo for us now. Um, I do believe today everything has changed. I do not think that silence is an option. Um, this is my personal opinion, but the question is how do writers write now and, and use their voice? Um, because if we do feel that we must say something, the question is, how do we say it and what impact, um, you know, does that have on us? Again, this is a debate um, that, that writers have had. I go on a little bit with Camus because I like this expression. It is better, in my opinion, to give the era its due. Um, and sometimes I wonder if that's where we are now, giving the era its due. Um, and, it, and it demands that writers um, cannot sit back um, in their armchair or up in the ivory tower. I would also suggest that the university is in that position as well, as well as those of us in the humanities. Um, because as Camus said, to create today is to create dangerously. Um, and any publication is an act, any voice, any act of writing. Um, and one that exposes the passion of an age um, that forgives nothing. I don't know why, but this, this sort of resounded with me um, as much as Dante Carr's words did uh, as to where we are now, um, our situation today. Now, movements have occurred obviously throughout. I, I, I've done a fair amount of work on Haiti um, and of course the Haitian, um, revolution, um, which preoccupied me for quite a while, studying it and writers there, Dante Gad being a Haitian writer. Um, the whole notion of Haiti being the first Black Republic, the second Black Republic up to the US in the Americas. Um, the question of fighting for Black rights. I've just completed a, a short bio on, on Amy Césaire. Um, and and this, this photograph, which I think is, is very impactful, has this notion of rights fighting um, and then that, that began, as I said, um, you know, during the Haitian revolution, even before, obviously, um, and with Black Lives Matter now, th these, this fighting continues. Um, so where does the writer locate, um, you know, herself, himself within, within this context? How, how do we voice um, all of these different concerns? What role do we play um, as an activist um, and, and how much, how important is it now more than ever to start seeing um, and, and writing what we believe? Again, the question is how? I would say um, with the artists, do we separate our work, um, our writing from 
our um, activism. For example, a writer like Yannick Lanz, also from Haiti, um, is, is very active. She's an activist um, and she lives in Haiti, has lived there most of her life. But her works are very um, intimate, uh, very personal. Um, and, and so she plays this sort of dual role of, of being able to write in a very sort of, if you like, quiet way, personal way, and yet um, is, is out there um, advocating rights. The debate is put succinctly, I think, um, by Pablo Neruda um, and, and Elizabeth Bishop. And I, I pulled again the whole notion of Camus of giving the era its due. Um, and, and what Neruda says, Chilean poet, of course, well, the, um, I'm, so, I'm sure you're all familiar with him, um, said, I have never thought of my life as being divided between poetry and politics. I have never been in with those in power and I've always felt that my vocation and my duty was to serve the Chilean people in my actions and with my poetry. This echoes a lot of what Camus has said and what Dante has said. Elizabeth Bishop, on the other hand, um, American poet, writer as well, um, she's always considered herself a strong feminist, but has been very much against what she calls propaganda poetry, that it really worked. Um, this gave me a little pause um, because I think when we think of poetry and politics and activism, we need to remember as well that there's a, a flip side to the coin, that the, the politics of voice can also be used to voice propaganda. Um, so depending on what side of the spectrum you're on, um, you know, where you fall on the debate, we have, we have to realize that it is, you have to be very careful of the use of that voice to push one idea or the other. And this might be why writers like Elizabeth Bishop would stick out of it. Um, you know, she, she, is, she was always very private, did not give a lot of interviews, but her works do have a sense of a strong feminist quality to them, um, particularly her poetry. So, but, but in terms of, of using it as a, as a political tool, and when I say political here, I'm, I'm using political in the broadest sense of the term, meaning the manipulation of power. Um, she, she doesn't believe that, that it should be used to promote any sort of, of political view. I mean, if that is possible, I, I think writers always write with some kind of worldview and some sort of perspective, um, but there are others who decidedly try to pull themselves out of it. Um, and this, so Pablo Neruda says something that I do think we need to, to keep in mind. Um, Although he says he's a political poet, um, what he says is that there's, there can be a tendency for writing, for poetry, for art, for any form of, 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 of creative expression, for the creatives to use the art um, in what he sees as a vulgar and una unacceptable way. In other words, in order to be writer, artist, in fact, any profession, there, there is a period of apprenticeship, of learning, and this is no less so for the arts uh, and for poetry and for, for anything that you do, for any sort of profession or vocation you go into. Um, so it's not as if you just suddenly start writing poetry and, and, you, and, you, and you become a political poet. No, there is a process. Um, it, political poetry, like love poetry, can, can be very weak if it is not layered. Um, if you have not studied the genre or paid respect to the genre and just decide you're suddenly going to write political poetry. Um, so what he's saying is basically, this is why this scream is blank, <laughs> is that he is, um, he can't really give any advice uh, as, except to respect the, the craft. It's the same, same thing like learning a language. Um, you know, you don't suddenly speak um, fantastic Spanish. There is, there is a, a route to get in there. You build on it, you learn, you make mistakes. And, and writing and art, is, it, it's no less of a craft. It's not just sit one morning and produce something fantastic. And so what he's talking about is respecting the craft um, before you are suddenly considered um, a, political, a political poet or writing political um, poetry. And I think this is important um, and um, an important addition to the whole notion. It is not something to be dealt with and not respected. If, if you're going to do it, you need to do it as, as, a, as a craft and respect the craft. Um, so I'm gonna take a little pause here simply to talk a little bit about um, the price to pay because 
Mary Vyoshovi, for a long time, I, I spent quite a while just studying her work and looking at her work. I have great admiration for her. Um, she wrote five um, works. Um, one of those is Amour, Colère et Folie, Love, Anger, Madness. Um, she was born in Haiti in 1916, and she died in 1973 um, in exile in New York at the age of 56. Um, so, of course, she, she was born to a, a privileged um, background, um, and Amour, Colère et Folie caused quite a stir when it was published, um, written in 1968 and published, and sorry, written in 1967 and published in 1968. Um, just a little background for those who may not um, remember, but it, uh, the Duvalier regime um, started, of course, with François Papadoc Duvalier, um, and he was he ruled from 1957 to 1971. Of course, this was a totalitarian despotic um, regime. Um, in 1964, he declared himself president for life. And then he transferred in 1964 um, the power onto his son, um, Jean-Claude Duvalier. And in, eventually he had to go into exile in 1986. And I do remember in 2010 with the earthquake, he came back. Um, um, I remember I always see that image of him come walking down um, from the plane um, in 1986, but he had been in exile. So uh, Marie Vyoshovi um, was part of that generation as well, um, again, from a privileged background of what we called the occupation generation. The Americans um, occupied um, Haiti. This was their first occupation from 1915 to 1934. Um, there were a group of intellectuals, artists, very much voicing, um, they were against this, this occupation. Um, also, if you look at the date, although Love, Anger, um, Madness, Amour, Colère, Folie is set in around 1939, it, it really is dealing with the Papadoc Duvalier regime. And the character, Claire Clamont, in Amour, says, says this. We have been practicing at cutting each other's throats since independence. The claws of our people have been growing and getting sharper. Hatred has hatched among us and torturers have crawled out of the nest. They torture you before cutting your throat. It's a colonial legacy to which we cling, just as we cling to French. We excel at the former, but struggle uh, with the latter. Um, interesting to note, um, that Claire, the character of Claire in, in the novel, it's Claire and she has two other sisters. She is the darkest of the three sisters. They're both in love with a white French um, man who's there in the house. So the talking about we clinging to the French has this whole notion of that, particularly the bourgeois Haitian clan um, deciding to be um, sometimes even more French than the French. Um, and, and also she talks about the situation in Haiti um, the, the, she's obviously referring to the, to the Duvalier regime, but Duvalier is never named out, outright. Um, it is uh, Colonel Kaledou who is in the book, and he is the one who is the torturer and the one who is um, manipulating all of the people in the town, etc. But he, of course, is a, is a figure for um, um, the Duvalier regime. Now, what happened with the book? After this book was published, um, the, I believe it was the Haitian um, ambassador, um, they got word of, of the book and how, um, how troubling the content of the book was. Why was it troubling? Um, because in each of this, it's a triptych. So in each triptych, you have the characters or the protagonists questioning um, everything. So in this, you, you have the question of, of the regime and violence. Um, in Colère, it's the same thing, patriarchal order. And in Folly, it's, 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 uh, it's very much like um, waiting for Godot um, setup, where you have these artists just beginning to question religion, society, um, the, the political situation. Um, so this is an example of creating dangerously. Um, and what happened um, was also uh, very, very interesting um, because with the Haitian ambassador getting um, notes of this book being published, 
um, what they had to do because the family was warned that this book could be very dangerous and, and, in, and, and in the Haitian context dangerous could mean anything um, you know torture death exile um, they stopped the distribution um, of the book and Chauvet who went to, to New York at the time um, she also stopped the, the distribution of, of by Gallimel. Um, I've also heard I mean when I would do research on this book um, that, that copies of the book were burned by the family. Um, I've read this, I can't confirm it, um, but I can confirm that the distribution of the book was stopped. So she stayed in, in New York um, and, and, that's where, and that's where she died. Um, so I'm saying this to say that um, when, when Dantika talks, and Dantika uh, is also a, a great admirer of, of Chauvet, um, when Dantika talks about Haitian writers creating dangerously, um, you have the example also of Jacques Stéphane Alex Alexi, who was actually murdered, um, you know, for his writings. She's not talking, Dantika is not talking about it in, in any sort of, um, you know, uh, she's talking about it in a context that she knows um, what can actually happen. Um, uh, so, um, this is why I took that quote from uh, Mandelstan, of course, the Russian poet, who says, only in Russia is poetry respected. It gets people killed. Um, and of course, from Russia more recently, you have, well, not recently, but fairly recently, you had Joseph Brodsky, who had to leave Russia um, because um, he feared for his life, uh, because he was against, um, you know, the, the regime. Um, now, the other side of the argument, of course, is the whole notion of, of the text and the unity of the text, um, the work itself being enough. In other words, um, there is no um, destination. There is no, no need to write towards something. Simply the text in and of itself is the destination. So the world is in the work. Um, uh, and, and that, of course, is, is Roland Barthes' theory. Um, La Ferrière, who's also a Haitian-born uh, writer, he brings up all the notion of, of origins. Um, for Bart, it is the origin of the work is in and of itself. So there's nothing really outside of it. It, it stands, it, it's a standalone. Um, and for La Ferrière, it's interesting. He transcends that notion of origin also to include who he is. So when he's asked, are you a Haitian writer, Caribbean writer, or Francophone writer? I always use this with my students to begin the whole notion of the talk of, of, of writing and identity and so on. Um, Laferrier says um, that he takes the nationality of, his, of the reader. So he says, I would answer that I took the nationality of my reader, which means when a Japanese reader reads my books, I immediately become a Japanese writer. La Feria is very provocative, um, but he brings up the question again of, of location uh, and, and the writer's rule. So I, my time is almost up, so I'm gonna go a little faster. I'm nearly, uh, nearly there. This is a picture of La Feria. This is just to tell you that he is not Japanese. Um, and so Camus, um, Camus says, of what could art speak? Um, and I go back to Camus because he's talking about art for art's sake, the whole notion of, of what is the role of art. Remember, art for art's sake, of course, is a movement that started in the 19th century um, um, by, by Gautier, the whole notion of the role of art. And the role of art in, in this movement, La Foula, suggested that, that it's the same thing that Bart was talking about, that the destination of the work it, is and of itself. It's about beauty. Um, it's, it's not there to instruct, it's not for a didact didactic purpose, it is beauty in and of itself, and it is the aesthetic value um, of art itself that, that, that makes it worthy. In other words, you, it doesn't have to prove anything. Um, once you create a work of art, that is what it is, um, and, and it doesn't have to be political, it doesn't have to have any sort of social motivation, it, it's in and of itself. Um, and so this is my last slide. Um, so it might have been simpler or safer um, to be a doctor, lawyer, engineer. I'm sure you've heard this, at least I did in my time, not from my parents, but from others, um, because they, they go back to the whole notion of the role of the artist. 
Um, and for Dantika, she goes back to, uh, she's very fascinated about ancient Egyptian culture. And she talks about the artists in ancient Egypt. The sculptor was considered one who keeps things alive. I thought that was a great way to end. Um, um, I don't have answers to all of my, my questions, but I do think more than ever now, um, the role of the artist, given the context of, of the pandemic, um, of the humanities, um, is to create how we create and, and what it is supposed to be that, that we do to help society. I mean, that is to be determined, but I do believe that the, the era um, demands it. And I will stop there. Um, and I really thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Walcott Hawkshaw. So we are now officially opening the Q&A station. Um, I would like to invite um, our participants um, to bring up some questions or comments that you may have about this presentation or directly to Professor Walcott Hawkshaw as um, about her experience as a writer. I would like also to introduce Dr. Sabrina Chinian. She is going to be the moderator for this session. Thank you. We now invite questions from everyone. It was a very thought-provoking provoking, uh, presentation from Professor Hackshaw. And within such a short time to be introduced to all those writers, uh, Chauvet, Neruda, Zantica, Camus, Bart, La Ferriere was really thought provoking. So any questions? Yes, so we have one question. Uh, what do you think about the issue of the language in which writers write, particularly in a country like Haiti, in which the main language of the people, Creole, is marginalized? Yeah. Thank, thank you so much for that um, that question. Is that Ben? Was that Ben? Um, don't know who, yeah, I think. It's a, it's a really good question about the language in which you, um, you write because that too has a, a political um, context. Haiti is a good example um, in that, and, and, it, and it has also happened in, in Martinique and Sabrina, you would know well that, that at one point, um, and the same thing with Haiti, they were advocating that people write in Creole um, the problem is that when you write in Creole, um, you have uh, less of an audience, unfortunately. This happened in Martinique, I remember, with the Creolistes. Um, I believe it was Confia who wrote a few books in, in Creole. Sabrina will correct me, this is her area. And he had, it, it could not be distributed um, enough. To, to finance it. So it was a problem. He had to go back to, to writing in French. The same thing um, occurs in Haiti. The problem is a public, a reading public that will be able to read um, in Creole. So it, it, no way is, is the Haitian language um, marginalized. I went to a conference, I was in a, a conference in Haiti and it was strange and in, uh, but interesting as well that in the conference we had translation um, interpreters, sorry, from France um, we had people going well from French to English, English to French. We had people you know, Spanish, all the languages. And I remember the, some of the Haitian artists raised their hand and said there was nobody going into Haitian Creole, <laughs> um, which I think stumped the organizers hugely. Um, and of course, by the next day, there was someone there. But um, to answer the question, it is problematic. It is, it is marginalized, I would say, in terms of written publication but not necessarily, um, more and more so in Haiti, I would say Martinique, definitely St. Lucia. Um, I wouldn't say that it's cruel, it's marginalized, um, but in terms of the written work, um, yes, I think that still happens and mainly because there's no, there's no public for it. There's no audience for it, sorry. Thank you, Professor Hackshaw. Uh, we have a second question here. Are the people literate in Haitian Creole? Um, yeah, I, I think if you say literate, you mean being able to read um, the literature. Um, if, if you're talking about there being a lot of publications in Haitian Creole, no, they are not a lot. Um, I think the predominant language is still French. Um, most works are still published in French. Um, Daniel Laferriere, who just won, um, well, not just won, but when he won his last um, 
the, the, the prize, he, he writes in French. So a lot of the Haitian writers write in French. Um, Dantica writes in English, but when her books are translated, most times they're translated into French first. Um, so I hope that that answers the question a little bit. Okay, thank you. And we have a third question. Considering the extensive and diverse nature of the Haitian works and report of their historical and painful journey, what is your view on the impact that it has had in terms of positive or intrinsic change as for social justice and other related matters? Um, wow, that is, that's a, that's, a, that's a good question, a hard question and a deep, deep question. Um, it, it's strange that, that we talk about, I mean, I talk about reading and, and, and reading dangerously or writing dangerously. Um, but if, if you look back, um, how to say this, be, because of the impact of, of, of the readership, for example, if you have a large readership, people reading literature will be influenced by it. Um, so that's why you could be literature. The irony now is that the world is not full of a lot of readers. Um, so that I, I don't know, I think if, if maybe if there was a film on Netflix, um, and I'm not joking, I think the medium now um, to make a more of an impact is a visual one. I am a literature person, so I will continue to, to talk about literature um, and the way that that can change things. But I think the impact, the visual impact is also very important. And writers have had, um, writers have had an impact because the Haitian writers mostly tend to be um, activists. So um, Dantika does a lot of, lot of work. And when she goes out to, to, to speak, I mean, I've been on panels with her and I remember it was the day after um, Trump had spoken about Haiti as a blank hole country. Um, we were sitting on the platform and she said, this is, yeah, I am from Haiti, a S hole country. I mean, she doesn't hesitate to, to talk about the situation in Haiti. Um, have they had, have the writers have it, had an impact? Yes, I think they have. Um, how would it continue? I would say reading, yes, to some extent, but I do think visual and film, um, you know, social media, that sort of impact is, is more important and very important now. Uh, we'll take one last question. So we have one last question. Is your response to Ben's question a socioeconomic response, that is, People who speak most of the Creole of poor and the upper class uh, than can afford, well, who can afford to buy books, not so much. Um, I think that class does have an, have an impact. Um, but the trend now, as it, as it was um, having, having a St. Lucia background, I, I know it's the same thing. At one point um, in St. Lucia, you, you wouldn't speak Creole. And if you're from a certain group, you, the kids would be taught English before they're taught Creole. Um, but now that has changed. Um, um, so I don't know if it's just a question. Yes, in Haiti, yes, there's a definite question about being able to afford to buy, to buy books. And the writers will tell you that. Some of the writers publish in Haiti um, in local local houses because it's cheaper to buy a book there than to buy a book that has been published outside, which will have um, a different price put on it. Um, so it is a it is a question of the of the socio it's a socioeconomic response. Um, yes, that 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 is that is part of it, but it's it's not just um, it's not just a, a question of class. Um, it's 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 not a, it's not just that. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Hackshaw. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I think Creole, talking Creole, some, well, it's plus, but as Professor Hackshaw explained, it, sometimes it's also linked to activism, like in Martinique, to show that uh, you're an activist, you would want to speak Creole on purpose, uh, irrespective of your social class. So thank you, everyone. Thank, and thank you. you very much, Professor Hackshaw. Thank so, you. We will have a short break of 10 minutes, Paula, and then... No, um, I think actually we can take one more question. Eric Metruja has one question, and then we move into the, the next presentation. Okay, uh, so the last question, do you think people like Tuyo and Gary Victor who live and write in Haiti are more at risk? 
than the ones you need outside. Um, hmm. Yeah, that is, thank you, Eric. That's a very, that's a good question. Um, I, I don't think it, they're as, as risk, as, at risk as, as before. Um, I mean, with the situation in Haiti now, it's always, always volatile. Um, but I, I don't think it is as bad as it was um, during the whole Duvalier um, period. Um, but one never knows. Um, and, and I think that's what's hard for the Anglophone Caribbean maybe to understand that, that when, when Dantika and other writers, um, people from, from Russia or even Iran, um, uh, when, they, when they write, it, it is a dangerous act. It is something that is, that is uh, when you're advocating for social justice, it's, it's not a simple act at, at all. It's something where you are taking a risk. Um, and I think that's something that we don't really quite um, understand. So I, I don't think as much, Eric, I would say not as much. But I think if you're outside, I would say, yes, you are safer. <laughs> you're safer outside. That's just my opinion. Thank you so much. And thank you all for the questions. I appreciate it. OK, thank you very much. Uh, we now move on. I have the privilege to introduce Dr. Clara Mohamed Foucault. Uh, it's a pleasure to see you. We have met in person. So I'm going to introduce Clara. So Clara was born in Princess Town uh, in Trinidad, and she grew up in Palmyra village, uh, village in Caracas on the banks of the Mahudule River in Gasparillo, in the suburbs of Marabella and the precincts of Spintagatin and Cura. She has since started to vow to Kenya and different regions of France, which is now her current place of residence. She cherishes the memory for the years of her professional debut as teacher of English and French in secondary schools in Trinidad. After graduating in the humanities from UWI, St. Augustine, she spent the subsequent years in France as a postgraduate student, then as a lecturer in French literature at the University of Nairobi and later as an official of the International Labour Office in Geneva, where she led many development projects all over the world. The Library Association of Trinidad and Tobago first recognized her talent as a writer by awarding her the first prize in their book review competition in 1969. She was later designated laureate of the Lent de Poète poetry competition under the auspices of the Société des Poètes Français and was awarded a medal for poetry by the Académie des Arts Sciences Lab in Paris. Her poems in French have been published in several poetry reviews and anthologies in France and Switzerland. She's the author of a collection of poems in French entitled Soupia du Récit, published in Paris in 2016 by Edition Les Poètes Français. She has since written plays in English, which she plans to stage in Trinidad and Tobago, as well as other collections of poetry in English. And today we have the pleasure of having uh, Dr. Foucault talk to us about the frontiers of literature. Thank you, Dr. Shinya. Thank you very much for your introduction. And I have such wonderful memories of Trinidad. When was it in 2019, I think? I met some of your students and that was a very special experience for me. Um, yes, uh, where should I start? <laughs> my, my, journey, my journey and my quest have been so long and involved. I think I'll start with, are you hearing me very well? I think you are. I think I'll start with a little story called Cheryl, the story of Cheryl. Now, I passed my A-levels in June, and in September, I found myself as a teacher in the same school. So in June, I was a student, and in September, I was a member of the teaching staff. So uh, I was teaching French to a Form 2 class, and um, I noticed that there was a child, a little girl of 12 in, in my form two class. And uh, of course I asked questions, you know, uh, let me see your, your homework, have you done it, you know? 
Her name was Cheryl and she always sulked. Her books were dirty, blotty, full of ink. She did no homework, she, she did little or no homework. She didn't answer my questions ever. And, uh, and she sulked and Cheryl sulked every time. I didn't always pick on her, you know, and there was no reason why I should, but I noticed it. And one day I said to her, I said, uh, well, Cheryl, there you are again, you know, I, I'm going to tell you something today. I'm going to tell you that when the bell rings at three o'clock, um, you're going to go home and I'm going to go home. And I don't know what you'll think and feel, but I'll tell you what I will think and feel. I will feel very sad, Cheryl, because I'll be thinking about you and how you never answer my questions, how your books are so dirty, you know, and um, you never smile at me. And um, I want you to know that, that I am always very unhappy. After my French class, I go home and I think about you and I feel so sad. So much for that, the term went on and uh, we, we, we were reaching the end of the year, it was the month of June. And I saw all the reports have been given out, school reports, and I saw someone running to me across the schoolyard. And she, the, the child was running and running and running and she came and she opened her arms like this and she said, Miss, Miss, I passed. And with a big smile. However, however, I had mentioned in the classroom one day, I had mentioned that, oh, well, you know, I was talking with Cheryl and, and trying to, to get her to work a little bit. And one of, one of the senior teachers who had been my own teacher, cackled with laughter. Oh, this was, and, and she summoned all the other teachers to listen to her. Hey, listen to this, listen to this. Clary is trying to chain Cheryl. <laughs> oh, this is so funny. This is, this is the funniest thing she had heard. I didn't say a word. I was 18 years old. I didn't say a word. And I said to myself, Clara, you will have to deal with this. You will have to deal with this. Be careful because you're here on trust. Be careful. The powers that be are very powerful and you won't stand up to it should you put yourself at risk. What, what I want to say is what I'm sharing with you today is what I consider to be the only true and lasting victory of, of my whole life, really. It's Cheryl, because I always remember her. I was one of these persons, I wanted to change the world. And, um, well, we, we've, all, we've all read Hansel and Gretel, or they were read to us. And um, there was one fairy tale called the Babes in the Wood. And I must have been five or six years old when I read it. And I remember when the babes in the wood, you know, when they were in the wood in each other's arms and they died in each other's arms and birds came and, 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 and covered them with leaves. I remember bursting into tears and I started to cry and I couldn't stop. And all the neighbors came running and there was this child crying and crying, you know, and they were trying to comfort me and I couldn't be comforted. I couldn't be comforted. The babes in the wood, this, this couldn't happen in this world. What I'm trying to say is that we know, of course, now that fairy tales are stories of initiation, tales of initiation about good and bad, symbolism, sleeping beauty, sexual awakening, and Prince Charming, gender issues are all embedded in fairy tales. And uh, however, what I'm saying is that I think everyone has at some moment for his, his or her life, a kind of awakening, a kind of awakening to something that is profoundly wrong, to a kind of evil, which is embedded in every layer 
of society. It's just there. And there is a discrepancy, there's a yawning abyss between discourse, mosque, temple, church, schoolroom. There is a discrepancy, this yawning abyss between discourse and what is happening around us. And there is a, so much invisibility in our relationship to what is happening around us. Naipaul talks about ways of looking and feeling. What do we see, really, when you walk in the, in the street? What do we see in a classroom? Was I, as a French teacher, to be a social worker as well? Why wasn't there a psychologist in the school? Are there now? You were the ones that tell me, I don't know. Are there psychologists now to deal with children like Cheryl and to help them? All Cheryl was doing was crying out for help. That's what she wanted, help. And how many Cheryls do we have to deal with? Now, I found Professor Professor Walcott Hackshaw's presentation so interesting, so interesting because she raised all the, all the questions that I think just about everyone would be raising in this, uh, in this, uh, um, in this project, in this uh, social justice project. And um, the question is, the question is, uh, are we, the collegial we in the humanities, are we to be, are we in debt to society? Because someone is paying for all this. Someone is paying for funding. There's taxation, there are fiscal policies. Someone or our parents are paying, but there's a cost. Is it a question of, of return on investments? What is our debt? What do we owe society, if anything at all? Are we divorced, we in the humanities, learning French or Spanish? Uh, learning French or Spanish or, or linguistics? Is, is our work and our, our, our work and study divorced from the needs of society? We have to know this. We have to understand this. Now, now, I'm speaking to you today as someone <laughs> who started out after the babes in the wood. I think I think it was a, it it was the tra the, my first trauma of a literary experience. It was trauma for me that, that such a thing could happen in this world. It started out very early for me. Evil the sense of evil, something that is wrong, something that has to be fixed. And I don't think I ever forgot. I, I think I just went from fa phase to phase. I went through, uh, I went through all the stories, all the books, all the children's books. And I went on to, after, after my stint with, the, with Cheryl in that school, I found myself in the halls and in the corridors of the University of the West Indies at St. Augustine. And um, in my first year, I remember, I buttonholed one of my lecturers, poor Mr. Bremner. I buttonholed him and I said, oh, really? I don't know what I'm doing here. What am I doing here? You chaps are so nihilistic in your lectures. You read Camus, you, you tell us about Sartre, you tell us about uh, the Enlightenment and so on. We, we, I'm, I'm lost. There are no values here. There's nothing I can hold on to. I didn't come here for this. I don't understand what I'm doing here. And we just, and I just left. And he, he we crossed paths again a few days later. And he said, I thought about what you'd said to me. And my answer to you would be that we, we don't give you truth here, the kind of absolute truth we're looking for. We provide you, or we try to provide you with 
the instruments for finding truth. Okay, the instruments for finding truth. I'm sure he was right. I, I appreciated his answering my question and thinking about it. That was first year. Now, in second year, a very strange thing happened to me. Very strange. Uh, for years, I've never known what to make of it. Uh, now, we had an elderly professor of English literature called, his name was Mr. Slay. Why well, I never had a personal conversation with him? Why should I? Because we never challenged anything, you understand? We never asked questions what the lecturer said. We, we gave it back in our exams. You may have read a book or two extra in the library, perhaps, maybe, maybe not. There's some people who only did coursework and nothing more. I think that's probably not changed. Anyway, Mr. Slee stopped me on the balcony, the second or third floor. He stopped me. He came close up to me with his thick glasses and squinted at me. And he told me this, he said the strangest thing to me. He said, you are capable of great things, but you just don't work hard enough. Mr. Slee, said that to me. I didn't say a word. What could I say? I didn't know what Mr. Slay meant. I couldn't know because society had sent me signals about its expectations of me. Society had sent me these signals and I had stored them in my mind very safely. Plus, I had constructed a fortress around myself from childhood up oh yes a fortress we, we we belong to a very conservative society and i had constructed myself within this fortress and the 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 signals that society sent me were as follows we are a dot on the map. We are small. Let us stay small. Let us not overreach ourselves. By no means. There must be no overreaching. No, 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 no. This is, you, you, you go to UWE, you, you pass your exams, you put two little letters after your name, you get a job, teaching job, of course, nothing else. It could be the civil service. It couldn't be diplomacy out of the question, not even mentioned. The signals were sent and we stored them and we constructed and visualized ourselves within this little safe fortress. My ambition was to be like everyone else. That's all, I just wanted to be like everyone else. I wanted my parents to be happy. I wanted uh, to, to, to think that I could cope. What was ahead and around me. And then, and then, it was second year, 1970 found me standing on the roadside, on the Southern Main Road, watching the Black Power writers going down to San Fernando with their black power signal there. And there I was totally confused, more confused than ever, totally confused. How was I to read this? What was happening in Trinidad and Tobago? What did it all mean? What meaning did it have for me as a Trinidadian? All this to say, all this to say that all this is just to say that I started out confused. I noticed this very early on, this yawning gap between the ideal as was, as was um, preached to us by pulpit, church, mosque, schoolroom, do good, be good. Uh, and 
but what I saw in the village. In the village, my family were the aristocrats. We were the village aristocrats. Why? Well, not only because we had a wooden house with a galvanized roof, whereas all the others up Friendship Road were living in hovels because it was in the middle of a sugar estate. And uh, these people went to school or didn't go to school, you know. I went to school every day, of course. Uh, as I said, my, my family, we were, we were lords of the manor. But if we were lords of the manor, it, it is because we had access to something that no one else had access to. We were the only ones in the village who had access to a form of power and magic that no one else understood. There were books and newspapers. We had books. We had a dictionary. Can you imagine? People talked about that. They said they, they had a dictionary too. And people came uh, to collect our old newspapers, not to read them, but for wrapping. Oh yes, for wrapping and packaging. And we hoarded them and kept them. So what I am trying to say is that literature has always been about power and magic. Power and magic. That is what literature is about. Whether it's Oliver Twist or Thomas Midnight Garden or the Mystic Masseur or the Lonely Londoners, you know, uh, Willa Cather, Willa Cather, an American author, um, talks about this. She says that you can analyze, you can analyze a text as much as you can. You can look at the stylistics, how it's constructed. You can you can look at signifies and signif and signify. You can you can construct paradigms, facing paradigms. But there will always be something in the in the text that is more than the text, always. And that's where the a writer's genius Flower, flowers. That's that is what writing is about: a flourishing, the unknown. Quantity. There will always be the unknown quantity. I'll just, I'll just come back now to my years at UE very briefly. Now, you see, we in the Faculty of Arts, I did English, French, and Spanish. Of course, you know, our syllabus was was um, very much, very much. Uh, I mean. Uh, very classic, of course, and um, we never challenged, we never challenged the methodologies. We didn't know about other methodologies. We, we, were, we were just continuing on from the colonial syllabus that other people did in, um, in England, perhaps Ireland. Uh, that, that was it really. It never occurred to us to challenge anything or to question anything. So we were students studying English literature, let's say, within a framework called the Western Literary Humanist Tradition, run by, controlled by Mr. Leavis, if, you, if that name rings a bell, Leavis, the Western Literary Humanist Tradition. Now, what did that mean? It meant, uh, as we saw it and understood it, it meant that by the word humanist, that it's the human being is at, at the center of gravity and in control of what is happening elsewhere. Human being, the human being at the center and something, other things are happening elsewhere, but it didn't matter. So much so that uh, entire forests, entire forests were cut down to produce pulp and paper so that, so that those Oxford dons could debate whether or not Othello 
was a black man. Pages and pages and pages and pages I had to pour over to find out, to, 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 to study Othello. There was, there was just so much written about whether Othello was a black man and it went on and on and on. Mercifully, mercifully, that was not all we did. We did much more, but we didn't go very much. We didn't go outside of that framework, this famous Western literary humanist tradition stroke Judeo-Christian. That, that was it really. In French, it was the Enlightenment, the classics, the romantics, very neatly classified, you know, with the isms, classicism, romanticism. Later, of course, of course, the isms were inexhaustible. All the isms, intertext, intertextuality, structuralism, then deconstruction, and I don't know where we are now. What we must take into account is that there has been a rupture and fragmentation, which means that I came out of the University of the West Indies with my bagage, as they say in French, you know, with my, with my possessions of, of a certain way of reading a text, with a certain filter, if at all. How do you interpret a literary work? And um, I, I found myself in a foreign country on a French campus where I was totally lost, totally lost. What had happened? What had happened? Well, around me, people were talking about the collective unconscious, about Alain Robrier, you know, and... Um, and uh, structuralism, Julia Kristeva. This was in the aftermath of 1968. I, I went to France in 1971, and France, the lecture hall was still seething with anger. It, it was seething. And I felt the tension in the lecture hall. And no lecturer could pronounce a word without being challenged by the students. Whatever the lecturer said was challenged at once. And methodologies had changed very fast in France. The students no longer wanted the great lecture with a lecturer up there and uh, you down there taking notes and then you know, regurgitating the notes at the time of the examination. No, no, it was all done through expose. Each, the whole teaching organization was done through a system of expose, where, where a, a student took a, a topic and presented a paper and there, there was discussion. Expose, so the magisterial role of the lecturer was out, it was thrown out. And of course, of course, I had never heard about a signifier and a signify before I went to France, never. Nowhere was it written. I had never opened a book. I don't think there was a, a book on linguistics at all at that time. No one talked about linguistics. No one taught linguistics. And as to, as to paradigms and phonemes, morphemes, don't even think about it. So I found myself in a situation where I, I felt totally lost. Not only that, not only that, I found myself among people who seemed so unhappy. I came from a society, of course I had stored, you know, all the stereotypes in my mind in constructing myself. I came to France with all these stereotypes that we were happy-go-lucky people, you know. There's no madness in Trinidad. We don't, we don't get nervous breakdowns. And you know, we, we are easygoing people. And, and I, I had, I constructed these fortresses around myself and, and, and I, I was determined that there should be no breach in, in this fortress. There would be no breach in this fortress. And I kept, I kept on defending my fortress. Anyway, um, be that as it may, um, things didn't turn out 
as easy as I thought. Um, the fortress, of course, was breached uh, by my understanding of the huge amount of work which had gone into the study of the nature of language. And this started since, since Plato and before, well, before Plato too, from the cave, from cave paintings. This is not something new, uh, but, but we have something happened in the beginning, at the end of the 19th century and in the first half of the 20th century. What happened then? It was a time of rupture, and fragmentation. It was a time of moving from the stable to the unstable. From stable meanings to unstable meanings, from, from absolute values to relative values. Linguistics taught us that if, if there is any if there was any reality at all, it is found in the relationship between the signifier and the signified, between, between the sign and what it signifies. And then it was no longer possible it was no longer possible to hold on to language or to relate to language in the way we did in the pre-linguistics time, or to read a text, you know, without seeing something else that we could never have seen before without these instruments of scrutiny. Actually, actually, what has happened in my view is that in 19, was it 1918 perhaps, that a person by the name of Ernest Rutherford split the atom. He split the atom and found that in that atom there were electrons, neutrons and protons, energy, moving, moving masses, but not in chaos. They moved in a certain way, as if there was meaning in what they were doing. And in, in this interval of time, in the same interval of time, and all this was happening in science, rupture and fragmentation of meaning were also occurring in language at the same time. So we have moved from a world of absolute meaning, absolute values, to a world of rupture, fragmentation, and we no longer, we've lost pretty much our bearings. Or have we? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Perhaps we haven't. Perhaps we haven't. Anyway, um, be that as it may, um, when Sigmund Freud was asked, so really and truly, how did you come to develop, you know, the idea of the subconscious mind? And he casually showed his library, indicated his library and said, well, it's all these, these books, my collection of liter literary works, it's this, it's because of this, it's here, it's all here. A literary, in any literary work, whether it's poetry, a play, any, any genre, whatever the genre, it, it's, it's, there's something magic there. There's something that is happening. There's symbolism. There is, there are neuroses. Neuroses. These are words we now bandy about casually, neuroses, Oedipus complex, repression, uh, collective unconscious, you know, we, 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 we're not quite sure what they mean. What you have to know, though, is I, I decided to wear blinkers in France with all these unhappy people around me. All that seemed to be happening was analysis. There was analyzing. 
all you did was, you, you didn't enjoy anymore, no. And I had come from a background where, where we enjoy. I had come, I came from a background where enjoyment, where the hedonistic or some parts of it, some parts of head, some types of hedonism were permitted and understood and shared. And I, I found myself in this society where you, uh, well, everything hedonistic is um, not frowned upon because of course I wasn't in a Puritan society, but, but um, something had happened and what had happened, a major event had occurred and France was, France was in the midst of the Western literary Marxist tradition. Now, in 1965, I have to check the date, but I think it was 1965. Um, well, if you go up to West Indiana, section in the Alma Jordan Library, there's a portrait of a gentleman. Look at him. It's C.L.R. James. C.L.R. James, a Marxist, intellectual, writer, distinguished. He is the author of The Black Jacobins. And in all our quests and journeys, there are moments of, of a before and after. For me, I told you about the babes in the woods and the fairy tale. That was a before and after. It was an awakening. The Black Jacobins represent for me a before and after. You're never the same when you read the Black Jacobins about the Haitian Revolution. It is the canon number one of the history of Haiti. And it was the first uh, Black revolution which succeeded. Um, anyway, he was put under house arrest in 1965. Dr. Eric Williams placed him under house arrest. He had been, they had been at school together, probably in the same class, but they had known each other very well. Their ways had been divergent, but Dr. Eric Williams took care to put him under house arrest. I have the letter, it's on internet. You'll find it if you do a search. C.L.R. James. So his portrait is in West, West, Indi West Indiana section on the Jordan Library. Now, okay, I'm in France and I'm confused and I'm wearing my blinkers. But anyway, anyway, um, I come into the university restaurant one day for lunch and every day I come, I see these chaps, always two of them at the, in the corner at the entrance. Uh, standing there with the little desk, with the little table, and their and their books for sale, little tiny fascicules, little tiny books, uh, selling for I don't know five French francs or something, whatever it was, very small books. I thought to myself, but they're here every day, and they look so sad, as if they haven't had a meal for a long time. You know, what are they selling? I looked at them. And one, 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 one was titled uh, L'Ideologie Allemande, the German ideology. And the other one was entitled um, Manifest, of the, Manifest du Parti Communiste, the Communist Manifesto, by Marx, Karl Marx, and Friedrich Engels. I bought them. I went home, put down everything, and I read, I read them. Before I closed the German ideology, l'ideologie allemande, I was converted at once. At once I was converted. I had found that absolute truth that I had been yearning for in the halls of the University of the West Indies. That's when I told Mr. Bremner, I don't know what you chaps are talking about. I had found what I was looking for. Am I running out of time? Not really, no, I still have some time, I think. Um, I found what I was looking for, but I, oh, I, 
So that's my before and after. I was never the same again. You cannot be the same again. If you, when you read the, the German ideology and, and the Communist Manifesto, all I want to say, thank you. All I want to say is that I heard, I heard what you said about the decline in the number of students in the humanities section. I heard you loud and clear. Um, you will have to find a way, dear colleagues, you will have to find a way to let the students understand that their currency, their currency is lit in literature, it's literature and language, is the only form of counterpower which will prevail ever. It's the only form of counterpower which will prevail. You'll find it in, in other artistic forms, but if literature is to survive, language will survive, hopefully. We cannot be sure of anything. But it is the only form of counterpower, and if they do not submit to what I'll call a baptism of fire, if they are not ready to submit uh, to this baptism of fire from, from, from which they can emerge like the phoenix, you know, renewed, renewed, because we are talking about renewal. If we're talking about social justice, we're talking about renewal. So somehow this message has to get across to the students that we are dealing in, 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 in a, a type of currency which is at the same time bleak. It's a bleak world because, you, because it, is, it is a world where all the cognitive fields have converged. Literature is no longer just literature. Literature is psychoanalysis, history, uh, even mathematics, because Antonio Benitez Rojo talks about the chaos theory, where one and one don't make two anymore. One and one make three, etc., etc. We can go on forever, forever about this, but I'll stop here and I'll welcome questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sukho, for this very lively and passionate uh, presentation and all these compelling stories about uh, your experience, both as a student and as a teacher in Trinidad, in France as well. We have a second question. Uh, Dr. Foucault, what is it about the language of the Communist Manifesto that so resonated with you? About, it, it's about the master-slave dialectic. Today you're the master, tomorrow you're the slave. And, and it goes on forever until the end of, uh, until the end of time. And that um, in this master-slave dialectic, there is also the idea of perfectibility, that humanity can reach a stage of perfection because through this ideology of socialism. That is what stirred me so much and, make, and made me sit up in my chair and think, ah, and then there was 1989 and we, we know the rest. And, we, and there was also Francis Fukuyama who immediately brought out his book, which he'd obviously been writing before 1989, entitled The End of History. I hope that answers your question. Okay, uh, I have one question, Dr. Foucault. So can you just briefly talk to us about the collective unconscious? You talk about Kusteva, Julia Kusteva, uh, I think it all ties up to uh, the notion of what Professor Hackshaw was talking about this morning, art for art's sake as well. So could you briefly talk to us about these notions? It's, it's extremely important. It's, it's an important question and we all need to, to think about it. I, I really, I don't agree with, with the example that um, Professor Walcott Heckshaw provided a, about um, from Pablo Neruda saying, no, you shouldn't start with politics. A writer doesn't start anywhere. A writer never knows what she is going to write. 
No, it, it's something that happens and you are the first one to be surprised at what you have produced. So it, it's as if language has a power of its own. It carries you. You, 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 are, you are hardly an agent. You, are you an agent? You think you are an agent, but you are doing, you, you are doing nothing. Language has its own power. And um, when, if you are a poet or a novelist, when, when you have produced something, you're always the first one to look at it and say, oh, it doesn't belong to you anymore. It doesn't belong to you. You, you don't know how this has happened. That's my experience as a writer. I, I never know. If, if someone had said to me one day, oh, Clara, you know, you, you will be writing uh, in French one day, uh, poetry, I would have laughed. I would have just laughed. I would have found that funny. If anyone, had, and even in English, I, I would not have understood. And, and when it happened, I never sat down there to say, ah, I'm going to write a poem in English because I have nothing better to do. No. In my experience, it doesn't happen like that. It's a language that takes you, that sweeps you along. There's, a, well, um, Roland Barthes talks about neurosis. It's because of the neurosis. It's because there's some, if you either write the poem or you kill someone. It has to be like that. In fact, Naipaul in The Mimic Men, you know, this is a common reference. Uh, he, he, he cites Machiavelli. The, when you met the enemy, why did you not kill him? I often think of writing as, as the only option open to us if we do not want to be put behind bars. Because the enemy is always there and we are not empowered. We, we are less and less empowered to deal with the enemy. And when we produce a text, it's there, it stands by itself. No one knows who Clara is, nor no, no, is anyone interested. Uh, Roland Barth talks about the death of the author as agent, as agent. As, we're no longer present, we've gone already. The text only is there. So, so Dr. Shinya, I hope this answers it. This is where intertextuality and Julia Kristeva come in, you know, and they and 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 all the all the literary criticism works uh, demonstrate the power of language, something that stands on its own. We 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 don't count. We as authors, the text is there. The black Jacobins, it's there. Uh, you know, all the poetry we know, Rousseau, Voltaire, it's all, they've all gone. And there is a process of sedimentation where these works have stayed. Now, when I'm in Trinidad, uh, uh, you know, it seems to be that everyone is writing. And, and I think this is wonderful that everyone seems to be writing poetry or stories and everyone is publishing on the on, on, on internet. That, that's wonderful. And perhaps it was always like that, but there, is, well, there will always be a process of sedimentation where, you know, um, some things remain and some things do. I, I, can, I can think of one or two uh, 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 Trinidadian writers whom I, whom I can never read. I, I start, I say, but I must read this. I must read this, the books of this writer. I really must. I've started over and over and over again and I abandoned them. They are just so poor. They are, but they are published by the most prestigious publishing houses over the world. So, you know, what stays what doesn't stay, but there is, even there, there is a process of sifting and sorting, and it happens in a sort of natural way. I use the word sedimentation. So it's out of my control. I, I have never once in my life sat down there with a pen and a 
and, and, and a blank sheet to say, today I'm going to write a poem because, na -na -na, because I saw a beautiful rose, but I, I see no reason why a young poet should not start out writing about politics. There, I really don't agree with Pablo Neruda. We, the, the text comes to us and we write, write it as it comes and that's it. Thank you very much, Dr. Foucault. Uh, I have one comment from Carrie Tinto, which is also a question, but it's an ongoing uh, question. So I'll just read his comment. Very interesting presentation. All that has been said today has really impacted me. What I'm concerned about, however, is that where or how far back into the educational system does one have to go when considering the importance of language and literature. I have been in the DMLL and saw first and that the numbers regarding persons that pursue language and literature studies are dwindling. I honestly believe re-education and the importance of language acquisition, culture and literature need to be ranked higher. I see languages as an interdisciplinary field that is extremely powerful, but quite often played down, right? So uh, we have another comment from Nazareth Reese. Sorry if I'm not pronouncing properly. So Dr. Foucault, it is so fascinating what you said about your experience at the Parisian University during the 60s. It shows the difference in thinking and the resulting revolutionary mindset that the students of the metropole have imbibed versus what we have taught with regards to attitude to education in the colonies, post-colonial societies. We are still waiting for that revolution to happen here. That's so true. So uh, I will thank both of you, Professor Hackshaw and Dr. Foucault, Unfortunately, uh, because of time constraint, we will have to end the morning presentations here. And uh, we'll have a 10 minutes break, Paula. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Clara Mohamed Foucault and Sabrina for moderating this discussion. Uh, we will have a 10 minute break. Um, and we will return with um, one more presentation from Dr. Nicole Roberts. Um, her presentation is um, um, Reading, Desire, and Difference in Fe in this phrase by Mayra Santos Febres. So this is another very interesting presentation and we would like you to stay um, and, attend, and attend that one. So just 10 minutes break, a, a 10 minutes break and we will be back. Okay, thank you very much for staying with us. Um, now we start uh, the next presentation, uh, Dr. Nicole Roberts and Dr. Charleston Thomas are going to talk about race, trauma, and female resistance in Mayra Santos Febres, Fein Disfraz. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Paula. Um, you are seeing my screen, yeah? Yes, we are. Okay, and hello everyone. Um, it's a, a bit unfortunate that the Dean had to run off because I think that um, my paper today certainly speaks to that wonderful question that she had on uh, how, to, um, how to speak our truths and uh, uh, more so in, in community. So uh, the Puerto Rican, author Mayra Santos Febres, um, I think that I, I came to Mayra Santos, Santos Febres' work um, uh, towards the end of the 90s, um, but I certainly think that she's uh, among the most um, innovative uh, in the Hispanic Caribbean, writing in the Hispanic Caribbean today. The novel that I'm going to speak to, Fe en Disfraz, uh, was published in 2009, so we're talking about uh, 12 years ago, and at that time it presented a bold examination of the consequences of sexual exploitation and abuse on Black women during slavery. Um, and I think this is a topic which um, remains 
underexplored, not just in Puerto Rico, but across um, Latin American narrative today. So let me say that this is actually part of a larger study that I am um, trying to carry out on the works of um, uh, Santos Febres, and I'm trying to use it as uh, a way to um, map an ideological instrument of, of, of or use her work rather as a, a, a way of reading um, racial as well as identity uh, politics across the entire Caribbean, although her, much of her work centers on um, Puerto Rico. And um, in the larger study, of course, inter intersectionality is pretty much the theoretical frame that, that I use. So in terms of this paper, what some of the things that I'm thinking about are, how does Santos Febres present the black female bodyscape uh, through the character of Fe Verdejo in the novel? How do trauma and blackness intersect? And how does she present uh, moments of resistance um, in, in the novel? So in the novel, Santos Febres invokes historical memory so as to represent ideas surrounding time and the way in which black women's lives were systematically eclipsed from the Puerto Rican landscape. The novel is pretty short. In just about 115 pages, she tells the story of Fe Verdejo, a Venezuelan historian, who, while researching in a Chicago library, encounters several documents which connect the reader to black female Latin American slaves of the 18th century. Indeed, the novel's brevity is quite misleading because although it, take, it makes no specific mention of the history of slavery in Puerto Rico, it manages to faithfully document the lived experiences of slaves, particularly women and children uh, in uh, Puerto Rico and Latin America. So what I want to do is, um, uh, that is in this, uh, in this paper, um, is look at the intersection between an imagined past and a tenuous present um, through the unraveling of Faye's life story. And then hopefully uh, we, we're better able to understand history and historical forces, which in turn redound to an understanding of the present day uh, realization of the situation of Blacks in uh, Puerto Rico. In addition, Santos Febres uh, plays with time in the novel. And I want to examine that to show the ways in which she depicts the black female body and reveals it to be a site of cultural inscription while at the same time, one of resilience. And I think all of this really speaks to why uh, Mayra Santos Febres is such a um, central figure in contemporary uh, Puerto Rican um, literature. Now, much of her work centers on gender and sexuality, and this novel is no exception, but it does distinguish itself from her other works because it makes clear the history of Blacks, um, that is the African history of Blacks in Puerto Rico, and in so doing, it centers the positionality of Blackness to the Puerto Rican landscape. In a sense, the historical evocation begins when Santos Febres presents the specificity of slavery and its effect or rather the consequences of sexual exploitation on the black female body, because she argues that there is an inequitable and extremely violent relationship between black people and the classes in Puerto Rican society, all perpetuated by the vicissitudes of um, slavery. Uh, in the novel, she specifically centers race, but there are other concerns such as gender, violence, trauma. So the novel presents uh, or recounts the brief intense relationship between Martin Tirado, who is the first person narrator, a uh, white Puerto Rican, and the Afro-Venezuelan historian Maria Fernanda Verdejo, whose lives come together at the University of Chicago. Martin Tirado is a computer scientist 
who uh, leads a typically mundane life. Um, we learn that he has a girlfriend, Agnes, who's ironically a linguist in Madrid. But Martin's life changes radically and irrevocably when he relocates to work on a project in Chicago and meets the Afro-Venezuelan scholar. They begin a somewhat sordid relationship based on pain, passion, and pulpitude. Their intense relationship echoes the passion that the author uses to painfully reconstruct the lives of these Black enslaved women and thus remember their impact on society. We can argue that Faye and Martin's relationship is founded on historical relations, their love itself and historical experience, while at the same time, while, while, at, the, while at the same time, the, um, the monstrable sadism that, that is described to some extent um, of their union is underscored by the repressive background of slavery, which they seek to document in an exhibition of manumitted slaves from the 17th and 18th centuries. Santos Fabris is precise in making clear the influence of the past on the present day Puerto Rican society. First by presenting Faye as Afro-Venezuelan and not Puerto Rican. She removes the memory of the specific Puerto Rican past and later, as Faye's research uncovers Venezuelan, Brazilian, uh, Puerto Rican, and Costa Rican women, uh, Santos Febres then forces the reader to reflect on the legacy of slavery across, across the entire um, Latin American region. Now, at the same time, by making Martin Faye's white lover Puerto Rican, and at the same time, the narrator of the tale, this is a really bold step. And I think she sets him up to be the official source of information. The novel is told from Martin's point of view and all of the information which is unearthed is presented to the reader from the perspective of the person who documented them. What this reinforces is the notion that history is told from specific perspectives. Indeed, Mar Martin um, describes his, his job in this, um, in this, in this way. I am something of a virtual researcher. I do the same work as the monk scribes, but in cyber times, I recompose and illustrate fragments of the past. I offer them to the present in hyper real time, a time that mocks the death of the organic, the stillness of paper, the slowness of facts. And it is in this moment that we realize Santos Fabris' play with narrative and her subtle questioning of who precisely gets to tell official stories, especially where Afro-Puerto Ricans are uh, concerned. In a similar vein, in his essay, Desiring Colonial Bodies, in Maida Santos Fabris' Fe and Disfraz, critic Victor Figueroa points out the text insists History is never evoked from a neutral, a, a neutral objective position. Even historians write, or to use Hayden White's now classic formulation, on flow their historical narratives from specific locations and moments with their concomitant political agendas and ideological com compromises or commitments. Through Martin, Santos Febres eh, explicitly suggests perspectives on black enslaved women, which have been hidden by official historical narratives. So during the time that Martin is assisting Faye in digitalizing the legal documents and, uh, uh, and manuscripts, which she has found at the library uh, in Chicago, and also um, in creating the website, they find documents which reveal information about the history of slavery in Latin America. In the exhibition and on the website, Martin serves to give direction and in a way makes meaning of the documents and the artifacts. He rewrites history in much the same way that Santos Febres herself invents the narrative of the novel, both working to give significant meaning to the historical events described. For the exhibition, Martin gives explanatory notes and illustrations. He adds in music, subtly rewriting the narrative by injecting his own white perspective. And you know that at one point he um, he, he tells Faye that he he wants to um, 
put animation into the, the website and, and, and list the classical uh, musician. He wants to play that music. And so I think that through the inclusion of the sound effects and specifically classical music, Martin subtly shifts the audience's thinking away from the brutality effected on the black enslaved subjects to one of soothing entertainment so that the harshness of slavery is not memorialized through the exhibition, but rather the lack of sensitivity clearly shows the reader the ways in which privilege continues to dehumanize Blacks to today. Contradictorily, Santos Favoris his most interesting bid to positively reconstitute the image of the African slave occurs when Martin is seeking to find some images of the slave and is told by, by Faye that, um, oops, hold on. And is told by uh, Faye that um, images of slaves were few and occurred only in the event of a necessary sale of a slave or when the slave had permit, committed a, a crime or for a few pornographic um, photos which exist. And uh, it is only when uh, Faye makes a really cryptic response indicating that the enslaved women would have looked exactly like her that Martin connects the past and the present. According to Joy de Grouy, it is at this point that the cognitive dissonance that is associated with slavery comes to the fore as Martin regains a sense of humanity. He, he says, I stared at Faye in silence. Strangely, I had never before stopped to think that the slaves would look like her, that she, present and before me, would have the same skin, the same body as a slave, assaulted over 200 years ago. That that the objects of study were so close to her skin. And so clearly the novel's main thrust is the comprehensive documentation of the experiences of slaves, particularly women and children. But it is interesting the way in which the author seeks to correct ideas and long held false notions of the past and of these um, as enslaved women. Throughout the novel, Santos Favoris constantly plays with notion of past and present realities. From the start then, Fever Dejo's portrait Martin and similarly her chance finding of the historical documents regarding the slaves empowers her as an agent of action in history and presents the reader with a more humanistic vision of liberation. These enslaved women are made real to the reader through Faye's eyes. It is through her work that Santos Febres ensures that the reader grasps the, the vast importance of Faye's project, specifically to black people in the Hispanic Caribbean in the 21st century. The project at the museum is a way of rehumanizing the slaves and it brings a deep level of consciousness to their humanity. Being herself black and female, there can be no doubt that these identity markers influence Santos Febres' presentation of the positive recuperation and reconstruction of black identity among the women who populate the story, chief among them, Fever Dejo. In addition, it is through Faye's character that Santos Febres presents the black female bodyscape from the inception of the tale, Faye is performing identity. So the novel begins on the 31st of October and it's Halloween and Halloween marks the remembrances of the dead, a liminal time when pagans felt that the souls of the dead revisited the earth. Santos Febres uses this notion of pagan ritual to demonstrate identity as performative. Specifically, she describes the moment of performance as resistance by the very ways in which she structures the performances and her descriptions of how the female, that is Faye's black female body is consumed. Martin, we, we get a lot of descriptions of Martin who has to carry out these acts of cleansing as mandated by Faye before his um, tryst with her before any of the sexual encounters. She demands it. 
Martin's rituals are described in, min, in minute detail, and in a way they challenge the notion of the patriarchy as he is in fact performing for Faye in a strange reversal, reversal of patriarchal and colonial logic. Um, sex then is realized throughout the novel as an extraordinary primal force. Santos Febres uses carnal desire in an attempt to articulate a, a, an historical vision of the erotic and at the same time effect a significant liberation. These lines demonstrate that um, eroticism in Santos Febres' novel affirms Martin as the object of desire and endows Faye at all times with dominance and at the same time a level of dignity not normally afforded to black enslaved women. This idea, of, this idea is completely in sync with Figueroa, who cogently argues, for sexuality in the novel is not merely a metaphor or symbol for something else that needs to be brought up to the light. Sexuality and other affects are themselves in delusion fashion, and by virtue of their being, forms of desire, vehicles in the struggle for liberation, and spheres that need to be liberated in their own right. Now I'm gonna um, I'm going to um, skip forward to um, the conclusion. I spend a lot of time on the um, the dress, uh, which is one of the um, artifacts that Faye um, uncovers uh, in at the at uh, on one of her um, research trips. Um, and it, it's a beautiful dress that um, that uh, one of the women who was enslaved um, was able to, to, to become manumitted because she was having a relationship at the time with the, with the master. Um, and so Santa Suarez spends a lot of time describing that dress and Faye's performance when she goes out into, um, into the streets on, on the night of Halloween wearing that costume. Um, the novel ends though, just before the opening of the exhibition. But by the end and through a note to the reader by the author, we come to realize that much like Faye has sought to honor the memory of the enslaved African women, so too Santos Febres through the novel seeks to rewrite the lives of these women slaves in the Hispanic Caribbean. The fluidity of time is continuously underscored and through the interplay of time and space, Santos Febres' revisionist perspective is made clear. She sets out to and accomplishes a significant and commanding representation of the black female enslaved subject. Weighed down by colonization, racialization, labor exploitation, as well as gender and sexual regulation, Santos Febres voices the black enslaved female's right to social transformation. What appears most fascinating is that her assertions in this novel open the way to social development at both the psychic and corporeal levels. For Santos Febres, taking on these questions of race, gender, and sexuality is an issue of women's intellectual obligation and one that is significantly layered. Um, at the same time, we can conclude that she does this by making us not simply consider the causes of slavery, but perhaps more importantly, she forces us to rethink the consequences of those events on the human lives affected. Through this novel, Fein Distras, Santos Febres not only retells history, but she manages to tell it in such a way that our minds are open and perhaps, just perhaps, our level of consciousness is raised. Muchas gracias. I wanted to leave us with enough time to get in some discussion um, on, on, this, um, on this topic. Thank you very much, Dr. Robert. Uh, yes, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Good. All right. Um, Nicole, thank you. 
very much and thanks for asking me to be a part of your discussion. Um, I mean, we we go back a long time. Um, I just have to acknowledge Dr. Um, Professor Hapshaw as well. Both Nicole and Liz were my supervisors at the PhD level. Um, and here am I given, being given this task to, to question <laughs> or ask a few questions to, to Nicole. So I'm honored and thank you for that. Um, so Nick, I, you know, we, we talked a little bit about this in the past um, or before leading up to this, this um, presentation. Um, and of course I had some points jotted down to, to engage you on, but of the presentation and having heard some of the previous talks gave me more ideas. So I don't know which, which, which ones to use first, right? But I'll just, I'll just shoot. Um, so one of the things that strikes me about um, Faith and Distress is in fact the title, Faith Disguised, all right? Um, and I wondered if in your, your working on the paper, um, if there is any commentary on how we might be thinking about faith in disguise as a concept, even before moving into the business of understanding how Santos Febris engages these, um, this concept in, in, in a personality um, presentation. Um, which of course becomes a novel of 115 pages, etc. So I'm wondering how the concept of faith disguised, you know, faith is ordinarily in the realm of, of um, theological discussions and discourse. So how does faith disguised as a concept become a 115 page novel in which a white dude <laughs> is, <laughs> is narrating the story of a black, of, of blackness, as it were, and of femaleness, right? So I wondered if there is any kind of um, bringing together of, of, of that. Absolutely. And, um, you know, Charleston, all you've managed to do is give me more to add into the paper. Um, what she does in and among the chapters of the novel, and I, I didn't mention this in the presentation, but it does form a part of the paper, is that she intersperses four chapters which are um, taken um, directly from, well, they, they would have been um, papers that, that the author would have found mm -hmm. on various slaves. Mm -hmm. So these slave narratives are interspersed in the, in the novel um, as we read about this relationship with Martin and Faith. Um, and so, and they're different, they're different. Each one is different. One is Brazilian, one is Costa Rican, one is Colombian, one is Venezuelan. And not only that, the, the, the slaves themselves uh, differ. One is a child, um, um, one is uh, one who's having a relationship with, um, with a master. And uh, of course, uh, what they do, uh, what, what, um, what we discover is that some of the slaves would have had reasoning to take their cases of abuse, of violence, of trauma, of victimization to, um, to the, the, well, what would be the, the court at the time, um, which of course would have been the governor. And, and you'd have to remember that society at, at when we're talking um, the, the um, 17th and the 18th centuries, society would have been structured as the, um, the, the governor representing the king. Uh, and of course the king uh, appointed by God himself, um, appointed by the, the, the church and of course God. So, so the point about, um, about it is a lot of the time when the governor recognized that there were genuine cases of abuse, of victimization, of rape, um, the governor is unable to, to, to do anything but place that slave in another, in another home. Um, and, and maybe the cycle would, would repeat uh, or start again, but th that's all that would happen. So in a sense, there is this critiquing by Santos Febres of the um, notions of um, 
of of belief Faith. and belief, and, belief. Uh -huh. and faith. Yeah, because there is even one case where one of the one of the owners, one of the mass mistresses, um, mm -hmm. says, "Well, my my nephew could not have raped her because he is um, going to be um, a priest, and mm. he currently studying to be a priest, so he could not have raped her." You know, so there. I think Santos Febres uses those moments to, to specifically that to force us to question um, not just what these women experience, but also um, our thinking, mm -hmm. our belief systems. Mm -hmm. So that biblical understanding of faith, you know, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, um, that's precisely what's being challenged. That's uh, precisely. Yeah. by the yes. presentation of this kind of slave narrative. Um, so, you know, social justice is a big word, a big phrase these days. Um, and I, you know, I'm not a fan for, for, for things that I don't know for. <laughs> but um, because, you know, of course, let me just um, um, clarify that. Um, we often think about, you know, I was looking at, Oddly, uh, a series called SWAT, with Shimar Moore as the as the um, the star, and um, and this is a recent series, so it's a 2020 series. So they're all in masks and in the middle of the Black Lives Matter movement, and there's a discussion among three generations of men. His father, that's the Shimar Moore's, his 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 character is named is named Hondo, so Hondo Hondo's father and a young lad about, let's say 15, 16, who Shimamo is looking after, um, all three of them have this conversation about um, police shootings of black men. And the discussion stretches to um, the colonial treatment of black bodies. So the Hondo's father, that's the older guy, is talking to the younger guy in Hondo's presence and saying to him, now we call it Black Lives Matter. Before it was just called racial justice. So I'm using that to, to pivot, of course, the next question, which is, you know, how how might how might you reflect on the way in which my um, Santos Febres uses this very short, I mean it all might almost might be described as a novella, as opposed to a novel. But how does she use this twisting and turning of, again, I'm going back to the, to the white male character, um, narrating the story of, 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 of femaleness and blackness. Those twists and turns, what might that be doing to have us think about the way in which, like in, in, in SWAT, that, that conversation about generational abuse, generational misperceptions, um, you know, what might, how might you reflect on the way in which the text is helping us think about social justice of the issues currently? And to not just have us believe that, you know, Black Lives Matter movement is a new, a new phenomenon and everybody's, you know, happy and go along with it. Well, I, I think that's why I, I said, wow, I, I think we are beginning to look at what, um, what, what the Dean had, had mentioned. How can we and how do we speak our truths? How do we retell our, our, our histories? And I think it was a deliberate choice mm. to use Martin, mm. uh, exactly as you framed him there, this white guy. I mm. mean, he is nondescript in all ways. Mm. Um, and um, Faye is so much um, higher than he is in terms of the, the, the doctorate, in terms of- It is and everything, yeah. Absolutely everything. Um, to force us, to force the reader to absolutely think about what um, what what we what we know of history and what we what we think. Um, you know, you you mentioned um, the Black Lives Matter and that it's not something that um, that it that that is new. The idea of um, social justice has always been with us. Um, and I am, I'm, I'm forced to think about um, a situation that played out in Trinidad not so long ago, 
when someone um, indicated, you know, all lives matter. <laughs> and um, missed the point completely that yes, absolutely, all lives do matter. But at this moment and in this time, what's important is that we focus on uh, uh, on, on the black. And so um, I think that is something that Santos Febres also does in, in this novel. At that time, you also had these women and you also had these enslaved children mm -hmm. and what they were forced to, um, to endure. And mm -hmm. there are moments of resistance. How, mm -hmm. they, um, how some of the the, the woman, she tells the story of one of the slaves, the Amantina. The Amantina has five children mm -hmm. with one of, with the master. And um, the, the wife of the, the mistress, that is the wife of the, the master, um, absolutely hates her, enacts violence on her every time she is seen. And, and the description is, and more so when she's in the moments when she's pregnant. Because of course, the, the, the wife knows that what is being done mm -hmm. um, and um, dies, but leaves a will saying she must be sold to pay for my funeral. Mm -hmm. And so um, she dies and the master pays for the funeral, finds another source of funds, pays for the funeral and gives the Amantina her um, freedom, but rewards her with the freedom of her five children also indicating that they were his children. So he dies and when he dies, the Amantina appeals to the, to the governor. These are his children, these are his legitimate children and the children inherit all of the land. Um, and he it, it stated that he had extensive land. So mm -hmm. these types of machinations um, are also what she, um, forces us to think about. And I think finally that it's tremendously interesting that she chooses 115 pages. I think she specifically um, does that because she could have written a, a, a lot a more. I mean, there's so much to say, right? <laughs> so much to say about history. Um, and But I think she specifically went after that to get a group of us, uh, to get a group of people and certainly younger, um, people thinking about um, slavery. Now, so um, so forgive me for for relying on sorry, um, emphasizing the 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 gender, the sex of the narrator, right? But I also want to tie that to the Black Lives Matter movement again. When we had the George Floyd killing, killing, and the protests erupted across the world, one of the things um, that was very clear was the way in which the, the protest was an intersectional one. Well, the protests were in, intersectional to the extent that you had um, signs of LGBTQ al al right alongside BLM, et cetera, et cetera, all right? And the, the very cosmopolitan makeup of the protesters as well um, spoke to that intersectional aspect of the protests. Um, so this is an interesting thing that I thought, I always had concerns about it and we spoke about it um, prior to today. Um, the use of a, a, a female author's use of a male narrator to convey certainly some aspects of history, all right? Knowing that it is going to be problematic, all right? But still selecting it none the same. Um, what do you say? Is it a way in which, or is there a way in which um, the author is also perhaps unconsciously even, eh, but pushing us to think about um, the that state of fluidity that really explains sex and gender as opposed to the fixity? Hmm? And I think about authors like. C.L.R. James um, and Minty Ali, um, and who has a very brilliant caption of female living, and that only spoke to the way in which he himself was raised by a woman, and therefore 
understand something of being in the body of woman, not, not physically, certainly, but something about a psyche of, 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 of a female presence and therefore being able to write from that perspective. I'm wondering if the use of that male author and white male author in particular is another way in which the author is speaking to you know, that, that place of, um, of, of fluidity. So we have cross-dressing, the trans, transgender community, no, of course, very political. Um, so, so I just wanted to, to, uh, to get some, some reflections on that as well. And what you, whether you thought that the author is in fact helping us to navigate those very, um, you know, nebulous, nebulous spaces that we tend to also claim as fixed positions. Uh, without a doubt, um, I think that I think that male female desire is what she um, what she centers on, and and while we are witnessing the kind of um, the, the fading away of the of the relationship between Martin and Agnes, it was kind of like a non-starter from the beginning. Um, it, there is this intensifying of the relationship Martin Faye. Um, the the and so that that um, I, I, that confrontation or that interaction of the contemporary negotiation of male female desire um, and and identity at the same time um, I think um, finds um, roots in this. Um, play that she makes between this imaginary or imagined past mm -hmm. and um, a, a, a present that is so very opaque, so that um, she constantly plays with the reader in that in that manner. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if that is is an answer, but I see it more as um, her emphasis on male female um, desire. But at the same time, there are all these other things going on. Faye is a woman. Um, mm -hmm. She's a black woman. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the intersections abound. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, perhaps my last um, comment um, or question, rather, might be, you know, one of the things that, that emerged for me um, from having, I should say, not, not reading the novel as deeply I would read as I would if I were, you know, doing a course. <laughs> um, <laughs> but there is this element of trauma repeating itself. And I'm often fascinated by writers who are able to capture that. You know, I'm thinking now of a poem by Derek Walcott, um, Blues, um, in which he talks about the way in which black bodies um, visit violence on other black bodies in the US that are non-US black bodies, all right? So the business of, of violence continues, but it, it, it mutates, it takes on a different face, um, et cetera. And I'm thinking too of a recent report that highlighted quite, well, to me it wasn't shocking, but to a few people it was, um, the, the, the reality that in cases of abuse against children, women, women, have the highest percentage hmm? in, in, in a number of instances, in the domestic instance, in even instances in which the, the child stays elsewhere, right? The, 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 the percentage of, of, of women is highest among other abusers of children. I'm thinking too of a, an essay by um, Bridget Berriton, talks about the, 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 the history of violence in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, and when in fact um, there was a move to ban corporal punishment, Christian parents in Trinidad and Tobago were the ones who were against it most loudly. The novel of course talks about the ways, the ways in which these slave, slave women were, were, were enslaved multiple times over and the ways in which they tried to escape from a system and an environment of, of slavery through the, through the different you know, layering of history, right, by, by people's perspectives. But what she's also doing is, is showing how trauma repeats itself, like all those different examples I, I, I drew there. So I'm wondering if, you know, 
Santo Sebris is also pushing us to think about how we are still in the now of slavery. So we are living through a COVID moment, right? Through unknowns, through many unknowns, we research, we research COVID today for tomorrow, literally, right? But the experiences that we have and we share are no different to what humans have experienced and shared in previous times, particularly in times of deep um, cosmic traumas. So I'm wondering if there is a way in which that 115 page novel um, is also, you know, offering back to us this context of a slave environment and therefore having us think about the ways in which, you know, we always, I think it was um, Dr. Foucault who mentioned that, you know, the enemy um, is out there and therefore we are always going to be in some kind of enslaving environment, perhaps, um, reflections on that. Wow, is there a better way than absolutely? Absolutely. Um, another one of those, um, chapters um, that that is interspersed tells the story of Maria and Petrona. So Maria and Petrona, who are um, two two women who who, who were free blacks, um, brought to Costa Rica by the English. So they came. The boat had difficulties and 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 um, got into difficulties close to the shore. So people were able to get out, to jump off and, and come to shore. While on shore, people fled, et cetera, et cetera. What happens? The, 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 the sergeant, the, the sargento mayor finds them and he takes them um, and uh, um, enslaves them, has his way with them. Um, and she tells, recounts the story of of five or so days that, that they are held um, by the sergeant and he and each of his men then have their way with the, with the women before he then takes them um, and sells them into, into slavery. So in a sense, you, you, you have now um, one of, their, one of their, their own or one of the ones who are just, who's just like me doing, enacting this on me. And, and I think of what's going on right now mm -hmm. in Tobago with the Venezuelan um, migrants mm -hmm. who are coming and the stories of trafficking that we are hearing of that are absolutely real stories mm -hmm. uh, that, that, that these women are, 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 are whether found, whether brought, um, whether they've paid, it doesn't really matter how they come, but what um, happens to them once they, they touch these soils mm -hmm. uh, uh, or, the, or this soil um, and the ways in which they are violated, um, et cetera. And so, um, yes, there is this reenactment. There's this, there's this recurrence. And Do you think she read Toni Morrison? The novel ends in the way in which it begins in that the manner. Do you think she, she read Toni Morrison? Just like, I wanted to throw that in there to you. Do you think she read Beloved? Because I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I'm feeling some echoes of... We, we, can, we can imagine that, I mean, Santos Ferris would have uh, lived in the United States at a point in time. She went to... Um, she went to... Um, is it Columbia? I can't remember the university now. But she went to an American university. So we would imagine that, yes. Mm -hmm. Without a doubt. Thank you. you. Know. Well, Dr. Robert, oh, Dr. We've run out of time, but it was absolutely fascinating. I don't know if there were any questions. Yes, there are some questions. It was a very fascinating exchange, very dynamic exchange of ideas, and dealing especially with very topical uh, events yes. and issues that are impacting our societies right now. So we have a question here. So uh, from Ben, uh, thanks for the great presentation. You talk about how the novel documents and represents history by rewriting it. Can you talk more about what you think creative writing and novels can do that other forms perhaps can't? 
uh, well, I'm not sure other forms uh, today, there's so much going on. I mean, there is, there's performance, um, literature, um, there's music. I mean, I, I'm not sure that, um, that it can be set up in such a dichotomy of, of, of what one can do and what the other can't. I think there is this um, intersection that they, they can do similar things. Um, you know, I remember that as a child, I didn't like silent movies at all, at all. I absolutely hated them. Um, and my father used to look at them. Um, but, but, um, but I went to, uh, well, pre-COVID, uh, I went to, uh, a, a, a performance by, a poet slash writer Dominic from the Dominican Republic in Puerto Rico. And I, I, it was absolutely fascinating. And the only sound that he used was, um, well, I would say music, but it was more along the lines of the, mar the maracas, the, um, the shak shak things. Um, so, uh, and yet he told an entire story. So I, 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 I don't see it as set up in that sort of a, uh, um, dynamic. Um, I think they all do different things so that we can't really privilege the one uh, uh, above the other. Okay. Any comments? Uh, to what Nicole has just said. That, that's a fascinating question for Charleston, who I, I know is a musician. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, I, well, I am going to agree with, with what Nicola said. I'm, I'm not sure that any, I mean, while each zone will have its, its unique features and will do, will impact in, a, in, in unique ways because of unique features, um, reaching impact, impact and reaching isn't, ex, um, um, obviously is not exclusive to, to any one zone. And one, so, so, so for example, poetry does not, um, only have the responsibility or impact that it has and music doesn't talk, you know, I'm just trying to piggyback on what Nicola said, but what I also want to, to say is, you know, um, in, I, I, in 2013, I composed a song called Still Crossing. Um, and I first performed it in 2018 in Morocco. So it was never performed here before elsewhere. But when I composed it, it was composed with an understanding of what was going on in terms of what the world then called the European migrant crisis. I don't know what that is still, right? Um, but what struck me and what of course informed the composition was the way in which people traversed the Atlantic, sorry, not the Atlantic, the, the Mediterranean Sea and the ways in which bodies floated. So when I composed it, it was with that in mind. And the name of the composition is Still Crossing. But of course, once I started to perform it, it literally became an echo of the now of slavery, the ways in which we are all still crossing into something or crossing away from something, right? Um, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that um, that, that composition will do anything differently <laughs> to, to Santo Febles's, um 115 pages, right? It might evoke tears perhaps because of the nature and the feature, the, the, the peculiar feature of music. Um, and it might, make, it might evoke tears more quickly um, and in different areas, but the novel will also do a similar thing um, according to the day you're reading it and the type of the weather, the type of weather you're reading it with, et cetera, you know? So I don't know that I would want to Dichotomize the 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 zones um, and and I itemize each one as having a unique role. I, I mean, they all intersect um, and to each his own, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you both, Dr. Roberts and Dr. Thomas. So I think throughout all the any more questions from the panelists or attendees, we have time for one more question. 
Okay, I'm not seeing any more questions. I think uh, all the presentations today make us really reflect on the politics of voice, which was the title of Professor Hackshaw's uh, presentation. And also what Camus said that silence has dangerous implications. I think all the presentations speak of the Foucault, uh, the, uh, the dynamic exchange between Dr. Roberts and Dr. Thomas all point out to voice, the politics of voice, and also the implications of silence. So we have a lot to think about and to reflect upon. Uh, any last comments, Dr. Roberts and Dr. Thomas, before we wrap up this session? No, I, 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 um, I, I taught this novel this year in one of my courses. I feel like if I missed a moment to invite Dr. Thomas to that to that lecture to that um, class, but um, no, 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 I have no comments. Thanks so much, um, uh, Sabrina. Okay, thank you all for all our attendees, our panelists. Good to see everybody. Good to see everybody. You too. So over to you, Paula. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Yes. Thank you, Sabrina. Thank you, Dr. Roberts and Dr. Thomas. Uh, and thanks to all our participants, all our attendees. Uh, we will log, uh, with this session, we finish today, today's sessions. Uh, and I would like to do uh, for the sessions tomorrow. Tomorrow we will be discussing topics related to language death, um, acculturation of um, Venezuelan immigrants in Trinidad and Tobago, attitudes of Trinidadians towards Venezuelan immigrants. Also, um, an experience of teaching English to Venezuelan immigrants in Trinidad and Tobago. So I would like you well, to stay tuned. Um, us again tomorrow. Tomorrow we will start at 10 in the morning again um, until about 1, 1 p.m. So I hope to see you all tomorrow.